Welcome uh, everyone to our first um, YWeb Connecticut webinar, uh, which is also our first Spring into STEM event um, that is kicking off a series of events that are taking place across the, um, the country and in, into Canada as well. Um, we are really excited to be bringing this event to you. Um, so um, we are first going to welcome the YWeb Connecticut um, chapter. It's the newest chapter of our 14 chapters of Young Women in Bio, um, which is part of a larger organization called Women in Bio. Um, and we are going to be introducing the leadership for YWIB Connecticut. And um, they'll be sharing their career journeys and we'll have a, we'll have a Q and A with um, each of the panelists as well. So you can get to know them. And then we'll look to share with you um, an overview of Young Women in Bio and what we're doing as we've um, evolved quite a bit in the past year or so um, amidst the pandemic, and then also share some of the exciting activities that we're planning um, in the future and, uh, and you know, share some ideas. We certainly want to hear from everybody within the, um, the panelists that are, or, and, and the participants that are joining us today. So, Thank you all for coming. Um, we're really excited to, to kick this off. Um, so I'm Maggie Tobin. I'm the national chair for uh, Young Women in Bio. And um, as I mentioned, we have um, three of our YWIB Connecticut executive leadership team. Uh, all three are co-chairs and sharing the, the leadership position within Connecticut. Um, we have Kat Kaiser-Bricker, who is the CSO for Halda Therapeutics. Candy Huang, who is a assistant, an assistant professor of chemistry at Southern Connecticut State University, and Kate Jopling, who is the VP of operations for clinical trials at Cog State. So uh, we're all really excited to hear about um, their career journeys later on and um, all of the um, choices that they made throughout to get where they are today. Um, so, I'll take a minute to walk you through Young Women in Bio and what we've been doing um, over the past decade or so. Um, as I mentioned, we're part of Women in Bio, um, which is a larger organization. Um, but within Young Women in Bio, we are looking to basically ensure that women, young girls stay in careers in STEM. And we are encouraging uh, their participation in science, technology, engineering, and math through a variety of events and hands-on activities that are uh, typically led through the 14 chapters um, across the United States and in Canada. And we partner with a number of different organizations and companies across the country to uh, open their doors up and, and give young girls an idea of all of the uh, wonderful career possibilities that await them within Young Women in Bio and within STEM. Um, we have a number of most of everybody that works in young women in bio and, and women in bio uh, are volunteers. And so we uh, take the time to really um, help encourage and lend a helping hand to, um, to groups of young girls across the country. And our demographic um, is really targeting elementary school through the second year of college. Um, as I mentioned, we have 14 chapters. Um, as you'll see, Connecticut is our newest one that was started in um, the beginning of this year. So we're really excited to bring um, um, and highlight all of the exciting um, STEM opportunities that await all of the young girls in Connecticut. Hey Maggie, we, we can't see slides. I don't know if- Oh, you a... can't? Oh no. no. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's always, can't, you can't see, hold on. Thank you for, I would have like gone through the whole thing. <laughs> um, okay. Hold on here. OK, 
can see these slides now. Yes. Okay. All right. Let me uh, start over there. Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay. Our agenda, which I walked through, and um, the YWIB Connecticut Exec Executive Leadership that we have, Kat, Candy, and Kate, and we will introduce them a little bit later. As I mentioned, um, the mission of Young Women in Bio is to encourage um, STEM um, careers within young girls and try to keep young girls. There's been some evidence that suggests that um, uh, girls tend to fall off the STEM career track within middle school and into high school. And so those are the, the prime areas uh, and ages that we are looking to um, it, it ensure that they stay engaged. Here are our chapter locations, as I mentioned across the country. And with the pandemic, we have been really able to expand our outreach across the country and beyond just the chapters, which has been really exciting. And so um, typically most of our events have been in-person events and we work with a number of volunteers across the country um, to ensure that those events take place um, at in every type of um, way and opportunity that presents itself, whether that's working with um, companies to do tours within their um, within their organizations or hands-on activities at hospitals um, and things along those lines. We have had a number of events um, in the past on the Women in Bio website, womeninbio.org. Um, there is a area that focuses on young women, which you can see all of the events that we have taken place in the past. Um, and it's a great resource to learn about upcoming events as well. All right. Um, diversity and inclusion is a, a big theme um, of, of, you know, at present. Um, but in addition, since the beginning, YWIB has always um, have been, has been diverse and inclusive within our events. We have um, a number of events that target specific uh, demographics or targeted areas, um, but we've always you know, exposed a lot of opportunities to all different types of girls and we're welcome uh, to, to work with you on various events um, that tailor to any specific demographic or background that you're interested in. We typically try to ensure that all of our promotional efforts invite um, um, a, a diverse range of, of kids um, and girls. So Young Women in Bio, in addition to the chapter level events, we have a number of national initiatives. This first one um, that I'm highlighting here is Spring into STEM, um, which is uh, now fourth the fourth year that we've been doing this. Um, again, it's we kind of gather up all of these events that we're doing across uh, and led by various chapters. And then we kind of do a, a flurry of activities between um, at the, in the beginning of the, of the spring. And so we, um, it, you know, each of the chapters are leading their own efforts, um, which is really exciting. And this year we even have a national event, um, which is exciting, where we're bringing together three leading women in the biotech frontier who have been pioneers in gene therapy, um, Sheila McHale and Catherine High from AskBio and Marianne DeBecke um, from Bayer. Um, and that was, uh, that's coming up in April 24th. Our events are all, um, can be registered on the Women in Bio website. This is just a list of all of the events that we are um, hosting over the next couple of months. Uh, and so we encourage you to go to those events and click on the various um, programs that are of interest to you, potentially get some ideas for what we can do in Connecticut. And um, yeah, and um, enjoy each of those events as they come up. And you'll see some of them already have registration um, links to them. And then some of them are still in the, their uh, planning mode. So they're, you'll have to check back. Um, 
Young Women in Bio has also developed a number of outreach programs, uh, mainly over the past year, as a result of everybody going uh, into lockdown with the pandemic, we were able to elevate and advance some of the uh, programs that we've been wanting to do for quite some time since we were limited in having um, uh, in-person events. Uh, young, young Women in, or YWIB Ambassador is a program um, that selects um, high school girls who are interested in working with us um, as an ambassador and serve as a, um, a voice for our target audience, basically. And so they, they also learn to help develop um, events and participate in the promotional activities um, that we do um, that each of the chapters focus on. And so each chapter will select um, up to two ambassadors to help support them throughout the school year. Um, I'll show you a, a slide um, coming up in a little bit. YWIB Online is our, um, you know, recent push to, you know, embrace the uh, social media aspect as well as um, the ability to now record a lot of our sessions and share them online. So we have a YouTube channel that has um, all of these events that are being recorded and shared uh, online so that other, other people beyond the chapters can um, participate. The YWeb Showcase are more or less shortened versions of those longer hour-long interviews typically. YWeb Club, um, YWeb Clubs are what we're planning to roll out um, uh, this year where girls can, you know, um, receive a, a toolkit of information that will help them to promote STEM learning um, within their schools and they can work with their teachers to help um, you know, bring and introduce all these uh, avenues of STEM into uh, the classroom and into the, the school on the local level. YWIB Teachers is also um, an opportunity for content that, that all of our volunteers create through these events um, to provide through um, uh, partners such as Windward Academy who can provide content that can help um, bolster the curriculum uh, for teachers in STEM. Here's a quick um, you know, screenshot of our YWeb online. We hope that you guys will go there and subscribe to our channel and uh, share some of the videos, especially um, you know, with young girls who might be interested in particular um, content uh, or, or people who are being interviewed there. And there's always new content going on YWeb online. As I mentioned, the YWeb Ambassador Program, um, which is you know, our, our inaugural group of ambassadors. We had 22 over the past year, um, and we're still working with them to help you know, launch the YWeb Clubs. Um, they've been super energetic and helpful and exciting to work with. And um, it's really been a, a fun opportunity to connect with our target audience and see how we can best serve um, these groups. And so connect, within Connecticut, there will be an opportunity for, um, you know, one to two ambassadors to be selected for the next cohort, which is starting um, in the school year of 2021 into 2022. And so those applications are now available on the YWIB ambassador site um, on the womeninbio.org. So if there's anybody that you think might be interested in that, we would certainly appreciate you sharing and promoting that opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, the YWeb Teachers, um, you know, YWeb Teachers uh, partners with Windward Academy and other groups to provide curriculum and content for um, uh, a number of different schools, many of which are underprivileged who don't have the access to STEM related curriculum. So, um, if there are other opportunities to share that curriculum, we certainly welcome opportunities to partner with these, these uh, organizations. So a couple of years ago, we actually did um, host an event at Southern Connecticut State University, just to give you a little food for thought of uh, some of the things that we, we do. Um, we worked with um, SCSU to invite um, 12 speakers uh, in a conference style, um, event where girls can rotate through various uh, classrooms and laboratories to learn a little bit through like 30 minute presentations. Um, 
we had Medtronic who brought in some, you know, fun, um, you know, hands-on activities where they learned to suture and develop medical devices. We had um, UConn come in and, and train on um, good practices for wearing gloves and, and protective gear. Um, we'd had, we had marketing and finance and, and, and sales as well. So it was a great opportunity and a great intro uh, to the, the um, Connecticut audience. And so we're looking to do events like this and other, other ones in the future. So we welcome um, and we'll partner with you to do, and we can also do um, private and public events. Um, okay, and so coming up, we actually have a um, event coming up within um, WIB and also, as I mentioned, our YWIB event, which is a national event. Um, but on April 20th in uh, 2021, uh, we are having our WIB Connecticut chapter uh, kickoff event, which will be virtual. And we'll have panelists from across the country, uh, uh, from around the, the, the region, um, from BioCT and, and UConn, Onco Synergy, Wigan and Dana and Alexion, and they'll be sharing their, um, you know, journeys and um, perspectives on the bio, um, the biotech ecosystem within Connecticut. So we encourage you all to register for that event and join us. Um, there will be an opportunity, I think, for networking as well, too. So that should be a really exciting. And then just in terms of other opportunities for your involvement within Connecticut, um, YWIB, um, as you know, I mentioned, we have three fantastic uh, co-chairs, um, but we also need additional vol volunteers. And that's anybody who is willing to participate from, you know, um, um, you know, young adults to, to other volunteers. We need help with event planning, uh, social media, um, if you're interested in speaking at an event um, or if there's a particular audience that you want to help uh, reach, we could use your help with community outreach, um, promoting the event, hosting sites, um, actual once we're allowed to go back online, I mean in person um, and move off the online platform, we'll definitely need help um, with each of those events too, um, as well as securing sponsorship and coordinating volunteers for various events. So please raise your hand and email us uh, to participate in these events coming up. And uh, we look to have a robust team of volunteers for Young Women in Bio. And if you're a girl who is participating in this, um, we certainly want you guys to follow us on social media and participate in our events and help share and promote them. Um, we want to hear from you too, as well as what content you want to, what areas of STEM you're interested in. Um, we can really um, reach out to a, a wide range of people. Um, and, you know, if there's particular careers that you're interested in as well. And we also encourage you to apply to the YWeb Ambassador and then um, help facilitate the YWeb Clubs when those are available. Here's just a, a little slide of brainstorm um, options and opportunities um, and different formats that we can do. We can certainly do tours, we can do panels, um, we can do interactive presentations um, and, and other types of hands-on activities. Um, they can be you know, anything, anything at all that's um, related to, you know, the life sciences, you know, engineering, coding, finance, um, you know, the, the legal system, math, of course. Uh, so, you know, just keep these in mind and we will work with you to help uh, bring them to life. Okay, so now I wanted to introduce, um, um, our Connecticut leaders, and um, after um, I introduce them, they'll each share a couple of minutes of their career journey, and then we're going to jump into a QA, and a um, which will, um, you know, get to know them better, and then we certainly welcome questions from the audience uh, as well. So, um, so Kat Kieser Bricker, as I mentioned, is the Chief Scientific Officer from Health Therapeutics. She'll kick off the, uh, the first um, conversation and I will bounce to her slide. Okay. 
There we go. There goes. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. So I'm Kat Kayser Bricker, as Maggie mentioned, I'm currently the Chief Scientific, Scientific Officer at Halda Therapeutics, which is a Connecticut-based startup company. I'm very excited to be part of YWeb Connecticut and be part of the leadership. Um, I know that you know, I've always been interested in science, but there were definitely some key programs I can point back to in my uh, young years, middle and high school, that really influenced um, my path for a career in STEM. So I'm you know, passionate about providing those opportunities to other uh, young girls as they navigate their own careers. So um, I grew up in Maryland. Um, I didn't go far for college. I went to the University of Maryland College Park. And, you know, I was always interested in science and in high school, I took every AP class that was offered uh, for science. And when I entered college, um, I, I, I majored in uh, actually biochemistry. Um, I was very interested in chemistry, but also biology. And as you'll see, as we walk through my career journey, I have a pretty broad, um, uh, pretty uh, broad passion for, you know, multiple disciplines. And I really gravitated to biochemistry because it allowed me to take uh, not only chemistry classes, but a number of biology classes as well. And it wasn't until my sophomore year that I took organic chemistry. And I have to say, I'm probably one of the only, you know, very few people that take that class and say, you know, this is for me. Uh, I took organic and it, it allowed me to exercise both sides of my brain. I'm, I, my mom is an artist and my father is a chemist. And I have to say that organic chemistry allowed me to use that spatial thinking to think about how molecules look in three dimensions, how they interact with each other, how uh, reactions occur. And I just found it completely fascinating. Um, so at that, in my junior year, I decided to um, find a lab in which I could do some organic chemistry. And I worked in the lab of uh, Jeff Davis uh, doing these guanosine quartets that, to capture cations. And what the, you know, the best experience for that was, you know, really interacting with graduate students as well as my PI and getting to understand what it would be like to have, you know, do a graduate career in organic chemistry. Um, so then I decided to move on and do my PhD in organic chemistry and looked at a number of universities, but settled upon Yale University. When I visited, it felt like uh, the right environment for me to do my PhD. It's a pretty intense period in your life. Um, so you want it to be the right fit. And the department was great. They had numerous professors I was interested in working for. And um, I did uh, my PhD thesis in the lab of Andrew Hamilton, which was a medicinal chemistry project focused on uh, substrate mimetic inhibitors of AKT for cancer. And um, you know, that was a really great experience because it allowed me to make molecules, test them in assays that um, I developed in the lab, do some molecular modeling, as you see the picture on the bottom left. Um, so it really gave me that sense for what it would be like to have a career in medicinal chemistry. And, you know, I was really fascinated by it, making molecules for a purpose. And so that's really what got me thinking about a career in industry. But before I moved on uh, to that, I did a postdoc also at Yale University in the lab of Professor Scott Miller, who did peptidomimetic um, catalysts for, um, or sorry, peptide-based catalysts for uh, phosphorylation. So you can see one of those catalysts shown there. Uh, and I really was focused on expanding my synthetic repertoire before I got into industry. Uh, so that was a great experience. And then in 2009, I joined Forma Therapeutics, which was a startup at the time. I was there for over 10 years and we grew to be a pretty a mid-sized company of about 200 people. And uh, it was great. I got to see all, the, all um, aspects of drug discovery, all the way from uh, hit identification, and um, you know, target selection uh, and target validation all the way through to drug candidate selection and into the clinic. And I was uh, a member of the team that took the first clinical asset for Forma um, into patients, which was really exciting. Uh, I got to do numerous technologies, high-speed automated synthesis, DNA encoded libraries, um, some really uh, exciting opportunities to bring those uh, different technologies to Forma and have it impact their science. And there was a project leader. I worked across um, uh, several therapeutic areas, including uh, oncology, immuno-oncology, and neuroscience, uh, and, and got to do some really exciting work. And then when I left Forma in 2019, I joined Halda Therapeutics, where I'm now the chief scientific officer. Uh, I can't tell you too much about what we do. We're a stealth biotech. But we were founded by Craig Cruz, who's a professor at Yale University and uh, the creator of Protac technology. 
Um, so, you know, really excited at one point to be able to share the innovative science we're doing at Halda. Um, but again, uh, really happy to be part of this leadership team for YWeb and bring, bring, bring programming to uh, young women that are looking for careers in STEM. And then uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Candy Huang, who's Assistant Professor of Chemistry at Southern Connecticut State University. Hi, thanks Kat. Um, so I am an Assistant Professor and chemistry at Southern and um, I didn't start out that way. Um, I did my undergraduate at Pepperdine University in biology at first. Um, and I studied these little tree frogs. You can see them in the upper left-hand corner. And I love doing research with um, animals. I thought it was so cool um, to see like how animals change color and how do we um, observe science in nature. Um, but then I found out pretty early on that taking care of animals is very stressful. And so I decided to change my research trajectory to chemistry. We don't have to worry about feeding your frogs and whether they eat or not. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was looking at uh, color change, which is a chemical property that we can observe. And so one of the things I learned as an undergrad was that if I wanted to understand biological mechanisms and what's going on in your body and stuff that um, I needed a better understanding of chemistry. And so then I decided to do my PhD at the University of Southern California. And there um, we worked on some molecules um, that were, that look like molecules that you'd find in your body, but we, um, we made some modifications so that they were synthetic. And so um, I particularly looked at fluorine in medicinal chemistry because fluorine isn't naturally found in your body. And so if we put fluorine into these molecules, we can track where they go and we can see, okay, how are they interacting with different organs and different systems within your body? Um, after I did, um, I finished my PhD in Southern California, I went to, San Diego um, to the Scripps Research Institute for my postdoc. And here, um, again, I got to work with animals, but I didn't have to take care of them. Um, and I got to look at, okay, can we make vaccines against opioids? Because normally when you take a drug, um, when you take like an allergy medication or Advil, you don't form an allergic reaction. Your body doesn't have an immune response to it. Um, so we designed these, um, vaccines, like we tethered um, opioids to these proteins that cause an immune reaction in your body so that it would protect you when you ingested opioids. And so that was something I got to work on uh, when I was in San Diego. Um, particularly, we worked on heroin, fentanyl, and um, other opioids of interest. And so that was really interesting because it was the first time in my adult life that I saw these like illicit drugs. And so it was like, where did you come from? <laughs> um, and then once I finished my postdoc, um, I moved all the way to Connecticut. So as you can see, I did all of my schooling in Southern California, but I am actually from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I moved to Connecticut and um, started my faculty position at Southern. And my research students and I work on different kinds of um, different kinds of treatments for bacteria, um, and and so antibiotic treatment isn't a great tool. It works really effectively, but one of the problems is that antibiotic resistance is growing, and so um, we are looking at okay, how can we find different ways to research how to um, disrupt or interfere with these bacteria in a way that doesn't result in bacteria overcoming the antibiotics. So we look at quorum sensing in Pseudomonas and we also are looking at Lyme disease. Um, one of the things that I really found throughout, I've been in academia for a very long time. Um, when I was an undergrad, I really enjoyed working one-on-one -on -one with faculty members. And so it's one of the things that I love about um, being a faculty member is half of my time I get to 
spend teaching students and just talking about career journeys and mentoring. Um, and the other half I get to do research. And so that's kind of my role as an assistant professor. Okay, um, now I would like to introduce Kate Jopling. She is the VP of Operations for Clinical Trials at Cox State. Thanks, Candy. So my career journey has been probably navigated without a map, I would say, and I did not have a very clear path in mind for myself when I went into my undergrad program at University of Connecticut. So I grew up in Rhode Island and have not strayed very far from my roots. So um, during my undergrad, I selected a major in physiology and neurobiology because I was really super interested in um, human health. And I was toying around with the idea of going down a clinical path, but I wasn't entirely sure. So one of the things that I did was try different things while I wasn't in school. So during school breaks and um, summer vacations, I did internships and I, and I worked at different places and I kind of got a flavor for what doing research was like. And so when I finished up my degree in physiology and neurobiology and decided not to pursue a clinical path or grad school, I jumped right into a career. And um, my first job after graduating from UConn was at a hospital doing uh, NIH funded research in a population of folks with HIV. And in that role, I was introduced for the first time to uh, a function called data management. And so having tried to explore different avenues and careers, I didn't really know what existed out there in the world of pharmaceutical research. And having had that experience at the hospital doing the NIH funded work and getting exposed to this data management function, it really helped me get my first industry job um, as a consultant with a small organization called VLC, um, working in uh, global clinical data services for Pfizer. And after a lot of trying different things and trying to figure out what worked for me and my strengths and interests, I felt like I found my home. You know, it was getting into clinical trials and seeing just the dynamic environment and the fast paced work and interacting with lots of different people and bringing together people with different scientific expertise and disciplines, um, but that you didn't have to be a scientist. And I felt strongly for myself that pursuing a career um, as a scientist probably wasn't what made sense for me, but you know, this was my place. So I spent five years uh, working on Pfizer clinical trial projects and learning all about uh, the clinical trial process and drug discovery uh, my focus was really still in data management, but in that role, I also got exposed to different uh, data management services, um, different data management systems. So I think it was at that point in my career that I started to get really excited about how technology can enable a research and um, started to get more exposure by joining different professional associations and learning more about systems like Oracle Clinical. Um, really just trying to grab information as I could and learn as much as I could about the industry and, and start to try to figure out you know, where I wanted to go next and still sort of without a map around the journey that I was on and, and really no clear uh, path in terms of knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I just kept my options open and took opportunities as they came. So in 2009, I joined a company that no one had ever heard of and maybe still haven't. So Hello, this is Cog State. <laughs> Cog State is a digital brain health assessment company, and we do a lot of work in clinical trials. Um, I oversee right now our clinical trial operations division. So I'm responsible for our product and service delivery to all of our pharma and biotech customers. And um, it's in this role that I've had the opportunity to learn even more about the clinical trials process and this vast world and how exciting it is and how many different roles there are within the industry. And now I oversee functions related to data management and project management and scientific support, um, training on digital brain health assessments and, and collaborating with all of the clinical trial sites that are um, recruiting the patients into the studies and administering these brain health assessments, collecting all of the data. Um, my team does analysis of data and reporting. So there's a lot of 
different activities that happen within my business unit. And we collaborate with pharmaceutical companies and clinical research organizations. And so for me, I felt like I found a place where it tapped into my strengths and interests, um, where I still get to utilize my scientific background and education, but apply it in a very different way. So um, really happy to be a part of this amazing group of women. And just for the record, Kat, organic chemistry was my nightmare. So we don't have that in common, but that's okay. Uh, I think we'll still have <laughs> a okay. very successful partnership here. <laughs> um, and so, um, yep, with that all said, I will hand it back over to Maggie for some Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you guys. That was really fun to hear your backgrounds and um, looks like we have uh, you know, a number of, of people here. I just wanna take the time to encourage everybody to ask questions um, uh, of our panelists as well as about Young Women in Bio, um, YWeb Connecticut, um, so that we can um, you know, make sure that we're serving the Connecticut region um, and Rhode Island too. Um, but yeah, so so I loved all of your backgrounds. There, it is really amazing to find um, how you know different that they really are, and how much is unknown. You know, you always think you're going in this one direction when you go to college and where you want to be and where you want to go. But um, I think resiliency and knowing and being open and having this sort of growth mindset enables uh, all of us to, um, you know field new opportunities as they come. And um, because it, it, there's one thing that we know in science that it's like, it's, it's always evolving. And so there's always something new to consider. Um, what has been the most helpful in navigating your career um, and helping you navigate your career? Maybe, yep. Andy, you wanna start? Sure. Um, I think what helped the most was having mentors. So when I was at Pepperdine, the, the great thing about Pepperdine was it wasn't a big school, but I, I got to meet all of my professors and know them on a personal basis. And so I could talk to the people that had the jobs that I wanted and to be like, how did you get this job? Like, why do you like it? What, um, how do you qualify for it? And what's the best way forward? And so um, my advisors were like, okay, well, you need to go get a PhD if you want to be like a faculty member. And I was like, okay, so which PhD group should I join? And like, they helped me pick like, oh, this is a good advisor. This is not, and this is how you um, progress forward. And so without their expertise, I feel like there's so much to learn. There's so many fields that you don't know about. And so um, having mentors and just reaching out, doing informal interviews was really helpful. Yeah, I totally agree, Candy. Reaching out and networking and seeking to understand others' experiences uh, in, you know, in different areas you might be interested in is really key. Um, you know, similarly, when I was in my undergraduate work, you know, my PI and the graduate students in the lab were so helpful in helping me choose my next step for what grad school should I go into? What professors should I start looking at that might have research I'm interested in? Um, you know, without them navigating that would have been really challenging. And, you know, similarly coming out of my PhD and thinking about, do I want to do academia? Do I want to go into industry? And, you know, just seeking out, talking to people and understanding their experiences and see what resonates with you, um, you know, is really important. Kate, you want to add anything to that? Yes, I agree with all of that. And I think for me, it was because I didn't really have a clear path in mind early on, it was that openness to trying things. And so I went on a research expedition to the Patagonia and collected samples from wild animals there and lived in a tent for a few weeks. And I, I interned at a morgue and thankfully I wasn't actually in the morgue, but I was doing data collection and, and data management activities. Um, but I got exposed to the forensic biology lab and a lot of it for me was, was sort of figuring out what I didn't like, which is also as important as figuring out what you do. Um, and, and just asking people like, like the others are saying, it's, it's really trying to get a sense for what other jobs are and then giving them a shot. Yeah, definitely. And were there, I'm curious to know, were there any jobs, um, 
like even before college or uh, in high school even, um, or activities that you guys participated in that um, like a young high schooler might be able to consider or entertain um, that, you know, like what, what sort of activities did you guys do in high school that would help you um, in your current role or, you know, lead you along that journey? Do you want me to take that one first? Sure. So for me, a big part of my childhood and in younger years was sports. And I was the captain of my soccer team. And that really taught a lot about leadership skills. And because I broke my leg right before the start of my senior year, I had to lead from the sidelines. And so I couldn't be on the field leading with the team. I had to find a completely different way of doing it. And that kind of helps shape the way you think about as you move up in an organization, you're not a doer anymore, but you have to direct people onto what to do and what to, how to achieve the outcomes that you're trying to, to get to together. Um, and I also just had a lot of random jobs working with the public um, in restaurants. And I was uh, an ice cream specialist at Baskin Robbins one summer where surprisingly um, in a corporate franchise, they have a very uh, specific protocol for how you scoop and um, dispense soft serve ice cream. And I got tested regularly on ensuring that I was <laughs> going according to protocol, not over serving or under serving our customers. And so measurement is a big part of science. And that was something that I learned very early on is kind of following the procedures and being as precise as possible. Andy, do you have a, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think like one of the things I had to do that was most challenging and I realized that I was meant to be in a teaching role was I had to teach, um, I babysat and I had to teach my little brother how to read. And mm -hmm. it requires so much patience and like just tutoring people that are like, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's like not my fault. And so like, being um, challenged in that way, I was like, oh, okay, how do I go about like teaching this person how to do this in like an encouraging way and like a productive way? And so I found pretty early on that I love doing that. Like if someone doesn't understand something one way, then like what are the different ways that we can approach it so that you can understand and not be frustrated and not be upset and stuff. And so um, I, I think early on, I was like, oh, maybe I should be a teacher or a tutor or something. <laughs> Nice. And Kat, do you have a? So, I mean, similarly to Kate, um, I, sports played a big role for me in high school. I was on the tennis team and lacrosse and, you know, really those experiences teaching you about teamwork and, you know, leadership amongst the team, you know, are valuable skills that you take into all aspects of, you know, your personal and your professional lives. Um, as far as my jobs, my first job I organized uh, birthday parties for uh, gymnastics um, place that was near my house <laughs> for little kids. So just, you know, organizing, corralling them, you know, keeping them on schedule. Um, those are all, you know, really good skills uh, to learn how to move people from place to place, you know, especially uh, children. <laughs> um, but then I, I quickly got a lab-based job. So in high school, I actually worked at a biotechnology um, place starting in my between um, my sophomore and junior year and worked in protein crystallography and you know this is one of the cases where um, I realized that wasn't an area of science I wanted to go into but I found it really interesting but one of the the things about it was that the women that I worked with you know it was all very rigorous you had to you know the, use these kits to grow the crystals and put them on the laser beam and all of this you know was really exact but she was considered one of the best protein crystallographers in the building, but she, you know, had all these things that she would do to help the crystals grow. She'd play music, she'd put them in certain areas of the lab, you know, she had all these tricks that, you know, somehow she seemed to be able to, to channel some creativity to, to help the, the proteins uh, crystallize. So, um, you know, I, I realized that, you know, there's some finesse and serendipity associated with science as well, which, um, you know, I've seen throughout my career, sometimes, you know, things, you, you get lucky and, you know, things happen you don't expect. So, um, you know, learned that that was part of a science, science early on. Nice. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, how did you 
come to acquire that internship um, in high school. That's that's a, um, a sometimes a highly coveted position to get. Yeah, it's hard to find. It was actually really, um, you know, my 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 dad worked. He was a chemist, so he worked in the area and knew a lot of people. And he started he put me in touch with a couple different people that you know had internship programs for high schoolers, and you know got in in that way. So I mean, that was networking through my family. But again, you can leverage that network through, you know, I have a middle aged daughter. One of her friends, middle school. Um, daughter, you know, and she's in high school, she had a friend that was interested in science, you know, I, I could talk to her, I could help introduce her to people, you know, it's leveraging any network you have, um, you know, amongst your, your friends, your family, um, you know, that the, there are opportunities out there, you just got to seek them out. Yeah, absolutely. I think asking questions about like, even like you mentioned, the parents of your friends um, yeah. is a good starting point. Um, there's certainly so much more information and uh, websites and and uh, that are available that were not available when, when I was <laughs> well, um, So, what um, we actually have a question from Susan Sobolov, who is the head of the WIB Connecticut region. Um, she would like to know um, what recommendations you have for young women in um, middle school who are interested in um, in jumping into science. How how would you um, encourage them to, or what would you say to them to encourage them um, to stay within STEM related careers? I think first get involved with YWIB Connecticut, but beyond that, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really about um, using your network channels and um, talking to your teachers and um, being curious and, and getting involved in things and volunteering. So I, I volunteered at a hospital just to kind of get a feel for what it was like to work there. And, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do um, to, to just really explore different options and, you know, to not hesitate to ask the questions. And like you were saying, like talking to your friend's parents and just just going out and seeing and learning more about the different jobs. Because like I said, I had no idea what clinical trials entailed. And it was something that I wish I had known younger and was lucky enough to stumble upon, but it's really about being out there and getting involved as much as you can. Yeah, I'll echo talking to your teachers. Um, you know, I, I took a lot, you know, every class that was offered at my high school. Um, and I really had an AP biology teacher who made a huge impact on my interest in science and, you know, giving me exposure to what was out there. Um, you know, he knew about all these different workshops in the area. So Howard Hughes Medical Institute was um, pretty close to my high school and they had a three day workshop series that, um, you know, he approached and said, are you interested? I can nominate you to go to this. Um, you know, so there are experiences like that out there. Hopefully once COVID um, <laughs> is over and we can do things more in person, but, um, you know, talking to your teachers about what's available, you know, here at YWIB Connecticut, we've reached out to a lot of local teachers as well. So, you know, just, you know, trying to expand uh, outreach and the network, uh, you know, getting the word out to young girls in middle school and high school about, you know, what is available in their community. Uh, since we are in this pretty virtual time, there's a lot on the internet um, that you can seek, you know, even things like our YouTube channel, there's lots of great videos that, you know, you can watch and uh, gain some understanding as to what types of careers are out there. So there's a lot of resources at your disposal. I think one of the things we want to do as co-chairs of YWIP is to work with different organizations. And this is also something that middle school and high school girls can do independently, but going to museums, to zoos, to science centers, they also have great outreach programs and uh, different programs for younger women and um, just uh, younger students that are interested in um, different things. So um, first exploring, like going to natural history museum or a zoo or like what kind of science do you like? Do you wanna to go to a space museum? Or, you know, the, the first exploring. And then once you find um, the field that like just fascinates you and blows you away, then um, reaching out uh, to those places, they usually have programs available for um, middle school or high school students that would be great to like get involved in and um, we'd like to 
you know, coordinate with um, these organizations and try and make them more available to our um, to middle school girls and regionally and throughout Connecticut as well. Yeah, and I, I, I actually just like to add too that um, you know young girls can also think about the skills that they bring to um, to the mix. I mean, there are a lot of companies and a lot of a lot of you know even startup companies, biotech companies that like don't have any sort of experience whatsoever in social media, and you might excel in, in social media. So you may be able to help spread the word um, or help facilitate research. Um, and it often just asks, uh, it requires the younger student to reach out and make that first move or ask their teacher. Um, but there, there are, you can be creative and suggest ideas too um, that some people don't have the time or the wherewithal to um, think through. So, so that's a, yeah, that's definitely exciting. Um, Great, great ideas. Um, so I guess, um, are there any specific careers, even though you guys are currently in chemistry and clinical ops, and um, if, if you couldn't do what you're doing now, what area of STEM or, you know, what other career would you be pursuing right now? I always had a really big interest in public health. So it still aligns with my interest in human health and, and biology, but more around public health programs. And I think some of that came from my first post undergrad job working on that NIH funded um, study at the hospital, because it was a multi site study, and it was overseen by the Boston University School of Public Health. And so I, I learned a lot about that there. And almost applied to their grad program when I got the job um, as a contractor advisor, but I think that's probably a path I would have gone down because it's very interesting to me. Andy? Um, so I've talked about this love-hate relationship I had about researching with animals, but um, I think I would have loved to be a vet. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> that doesn't stop me from being around cats and um i think that would be just so fascinating because you know it's not only like just being a doctor where you have to learn the human system you have to learn the, the like the invertebrates and the vertebrates and like large mammal and small mammal and um i don't know i think uh working like with animals would be so fun yeah i definitely want us to be of that too at one point how about you cat it's a little hard for me. Uh, let's think. Uh, you know, I, I love drug discovery and being part of pharma allows me to do not only the science, but the business aspects too. So I, you know, I have a pretty broad range of things that I, you know, I get to do and every day is challenging and new. But um, one thing that I do miss is the teaching aspect, which Candy spoke to. Um, during my time at Yale, I was a residential college tutor and I loved it. I spent, you know, several nights a week in the college tutoring organic chemistry and I'm, all the students were like, wow, you love this. <laughs> um, yeah, where so, were you in 2001 I, when I was suffering? At UConn? <laughs> I know too bad we didn't know each other. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think that if, if I were to do a different career, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be a change in discipline, but, you know, it would really be, um, you know, going back and, you know, perhaps being a professor like Candy with the research group um, where I really could mentor students and teach students because that is, that is something that I really enjoyed. Nice. Yeah. I always saw myself as like a, working in a level four, highly contagious, like hot zone type of place in Africa or some other place, <laughs> remote wow. location. Um, but then I had a family. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there, there is so much. And, and, you know, my own career too is, has jumped around from, you know, basic research to healthcare public relations uh, to si sales and business development. Um, so it's been really exciting to see all the different avenues that support all of the scientific careers that are out there. Um, so um, yeah, asking and being open, I think are all really great themes. Um, so I, I'll, I'll have one last question before we just jump back to one or two slides um, and close up. But um, 
you know, obviously we, we draw a lot of inspiration and we get to see uh, in, information uh, about other people's careers now. But is there anybody um, that you find like just so inspiring and, you know, if, if you have a quote or something from them, that would be great to, to hear STEM or non-STEM related. Anybody? Well, I have a quote that's always resonated with me. It's a quote from Harry Truman and it's, it, it's, um, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. So, you know, I love being part of a team and, you know, everyone feeling like they have an ownership over your goals and your successes and your failures. And, you know, it just, you know, all working together, not, you know, no one's really only looking out for themselves, but really for, you know, the, the greater group, which I, you know, resonates with me. My favorite quote is from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is women belong in all places where decisions are being made. And that's really inspired me, you know, to continue to pursue my career and, and being in a leadership position. And it really just speaks to how important it is to have a woman's voice in the room. Yeah, absolutely. I love RBG. <laughs> Candy, do you have any? Um, I, in my planning journal, there's always these like little inspirational quotes. And so one that was recent that I really liked was learning never exhausts the mind. And that's from Leonardo da Vinci. Nice. 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 Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right, cool. So thank you guys for sharing a little uh, bit of insight into your careers and journeys. It's been really exciting to to hear. Um, and um, you guys are always available for questions should anybody else have uh, more in interest. Um, and I'm going to go back and share my screen again and just jump to one or two um, slides. Um, all right, I think I have to, there we go. Okay. So um, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, and I'm trying to get rid of this thing. Can you see this, the toolbar up the, at the top? No. Okay. So, um, just in terms of social media, we encourage everybody to follow us on our, uh, both national and, um, Connecticut social media pages. So for LinkedIn, we have both young women in bio, um, national as well as YWIP Connecticut and also on Instagram. Um, so that's, those are both great, great places to learn about what we're doing, what we're planning, um, other people of interest that we wanna highlight um, within the, in the Connecticut region. So please um, follow that. And if there's somebody that we should be promoting, like, you know, we would love to um, help do that if there's, um, you know, announcements and things that are going on in Connecticut, um, please let us know. Um, and, you know, reach out with ideas and opportunities as well. We are going to uh, develop a Facebook page for the Connecticut region. We just have not had a chance to do that yet. Um, if you're interested in helping to develop content for social media pages, we would be uh, most welcome for that. Um, and I, I alluded to um, our involvement and, and um, we are part of Women in Bio. Um, it's a fantastic organization that is how I actually came in to um, uh, learn more about Young Women in Bio. But um, Young Women in Bio is really like the entry point into a whole lifetime of support that's offered uh, by WIB at various stages of your career. So there's mentoring opportunities, there's networking, there's um, executive level training uh, for um, positions on boards and things like that. So we encourage you to um, uh, check out the website, womeninbio.org. Um, from there, you can jump into the Young Women in Bio um, site as well and join the organization. Um, so um, with that, we would just like to thank all of the sponsors as well. We have uh, both national sponsors and Connecticut sponsors. So um, thank you. We can uh, not do what we do without all the support that we have from uh, these organizations. So we appreciate your, your help. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. 
and um, please reach out to us and we look forward to serving the community um, and encouraging um, the young leaders of tomorrow through Young Women in Bio. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you. Great night. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Thanks.